ECDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control audio series, ECDC On Air. I'm your host, Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. This past year through the pandemic, you might have heard of ECDC being mentioned here and there, but you may be unfamiliar with what actually goes on here in Stockholm when we're not talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. As an EU agency, ECDC aims to strengthen Europe's defences against infectious diseases. We cover a wide range of subjects including surveillance, preparedness, epidemic intelligence and response measures. We provide scientific advice, give public health training and raise awareness through our disease programmes. Put simply, we do quite a lot. On this first episode, we are speaking with Dr. Andrea Armon, Director of ECDC. We discuss the origins of ECDC and the need for a pan-European approach to disease threats. Dr. Armon details how ECDC has changed since the beginning of the pandemic and what ECDC may look like in the future. Dr. Armon, thank you for joining me. To begin with, could you tell me, how did ECDC come into being? Well, it was in 2003 when uh, there was the SARS outbreak where Europe was uh, affected. And uh, it was very clear that there is a need for a institution that is coordinating between the countries at the European level. At that time, I was uh, uh, head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the uh, German National Public Health Institute. And I saw how uh, difficult it was to get a picture what was happening in other countries, where we are at the European level and so forth. It was actually based on that uh, and also the feedback that was given then to the EU institutions that the legislative process for a European Centre for uh, Disease Prevention and Control was started. And uh, I have to say, knowing now of of the EU processes, dealt with in light speed because uh, the regulation for the founding regulation for ECDC was adopted in uh, April 2004, so one year later. And the ECDC started uh, its operations in May 2005. Okay, well, so before 2004, what did EU-wide health initiatives look like uh, before ECDC became into being? Okay, so I uh, concentrate here on the ones for infectious diseases. Sure. Um, and in particular, the ones that then ECDC uh, took on. And that was in particular for surveillance. The uh, European Commission funded projects for the surveillance of certain disease or disease groups. In the end, these projects amounted to 17 and each of them had a slightly different way of asking for the variables. So at that time, when I was at the national level, I thought this is not sustainable. Uh, How can you supply from a single national database 17 different formats? Actually, when we then started at ECDC, that was one of the first tasks that we had to do to take on all these uh, projects and put them in one single European database. So with these 17 different projects that were uh, being worked on previously, the idea was to bring them all in-house rather than waiting for something new to come up. We we had the expertise in-house going forward. Well, we accumulated the expertise because... I mean, it was uh, uh, put down in the founding regulation as one of our main tasks that that is what we should be doing. I mean, it wouldn't, it didn't say that we have to put it in one database, but uh, knowing from my uh, experience in Germany that this is uh, actually the only way of uh, doing this in a sustainable uh, format, I I set out to uh, establish this this, uh, single European database against the resistance of some of these project leaders. That sort of nicely brings me on to my next question. So more generally, why do we need a pan-European approach to disease prevention and control? During SARS in 2003, we saw there is a need for a coordination 
um, uh, in cross-border outbreaks. And uh, most of the disease outbreaks uh, or many of the uh, infectious disease outbreaks are actually cross-border nature. It is also when we then go uh, beyond the immediate crisis situation, it's also the uh, support to member states to strengthen their own communicable disease prevention and control systems by supporting their preparedness, by analyzing the, the epidemiological situation, producing risk assessment when there is a threat either in Europe or outside of Europe with options for response. A uh, review of the national plans, which we actually did in 2006 to 2008, where we reviewed together with the national authorities influenza pandemic preparedness plan of every country. And then we did uh, simulation exercises to test also how it works. We have a training program and we provide the scientific guidance and advice. Okay. Well, you mentioned uh, before you came to ECDC, uh, you were working with the German National Health Institute. So what actually brought you here? How did you come to Stockholm? So when ECDC was in the making after 2003 and I heard about it, I thought, well, maybe I could help to make ECDC into that institution that I would have wished in 2003 to have at a national site. So I started here as head of surveillance. And uh, since I have also helped building the national surveillance system in Germany, that was um, a good uh, experience. And um, I also work not only at the national level in Germany, but also at the federal state level and at the local level. So I also knew what it meant for a local health department when somewhere, either at the national or the European level, there was a decision made where the information to be collected is at this tiny local health department. <laughs> And that helped me a lot also to get it in proportion for ensuring that we collect only things that we need at European level. So when I started here as head of surveillance, uh, building the European surveillance database, where I integrated uh, already mentioned uh, 17 projects <laughs> into one single database, and then we could finally publish the first annual epidemiological report where the, for the first time ever, the data on all diseases under EU surveillance were published in one place. That was um, a, quite a historic moment. Now, uh, at that time, of course, it was a printed version. Nowadays, <laughs> we have a bit more advanced and uh, sophisticated uh, ways of displaying the data. But I mean, you have to start somewhere. And then in 2011, I changed completely the field. I became head of resources and deputy to the then director. In 2017, I was appointed director after two years of acting in that position. Okay, well, you've obviously seen many different sides for, of public health. Uh, what would you say the biggest differences are working between the national level, the European level, but even the local and federal levels that you mentioned? First of all, I have to say coming from a federal state where similarly to the EU competence division in health, it's a federal states or sometimes even the counties deciding on the health measures prepared me quite well for the European situation <laughs> because some of the questions that I hear, heard and still hear at EU level, this is not your, your, your competence. This is our uh, responsibility. I heard there as well. So in that sense, I was very well prepared. There are, of course, differences because the range of different capacities uh, for communicable disease prevention and control within the EU countries is, of course, much broader than in uh, uh, one country. The language makes also a lot of difference because most of the conversations, either written or verbally, are done in a language where neither of the partners <laughs> is mother tongue, native speaker. Careful metacommunication is actually necessary <laughs> to, to not run into misunderstandings. It's also that the difference in the national health systems, how they're set up, how they're working, makes the the interpretation of the data sometimes a bit complicated. Okay, perfect. Well, you mentioned the SARS outbreak in 2003 uh, already. What are the other 
major outbreaks in the early days of ECDC? So I, we started uh, working in 2005 in May. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, uh, we were only a few and we had a massive recruitment program rolling, of course. But then right in autumn 2005, so five months after we became operational, there uh, was a outbreak of avian influenza H5N1. Most of the cases were among birds. But there was an outbreak among humans in Turkey. And of course, the anxiety and concern was very high of the health authorities in the EU that this might spill over and that we might get human cases and the pandemic is loose. So it was uh, for us a very intense period because uh, we had only few staff. And some of the staff were part of a team that I think WHO sent there to Turkey. But then we, we didn't have a proper emergency operation center. I mean, it's nothing compared to what we have <laughs> these days. Our internal procedure were made as we went along in the outbreak. And we, we all used to say that we built the plane while flying. <laughs> but we published our first ever risk assessment on 19 October 2005. And that I think is, um, looking back, quite remarkable. So that was a um, very uh, uh, stressful period for us, but it put us on the map. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not comparable to the recognition that we have nowadays, <laughs> but compared to that five months ago, nobody knew uh, at all uh, sometimes even at national level, but uh, definitely also uh, in the wider media landscape, for instance, we were someone at that point. So then there were other occasions we had. I remember vividly there was one American tourist coming with multi-drug resistant, if not extremely drug resistant tuberculosis while taking several flights within the EU. So that was our first uh, EU-wide plane tracking. And uh, then um, uh, there were uh, other smaller uh, outbreaks. But then the next big occasion was really the influenza pandemic in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic. And after the current pandemic, that was the second longest public health emergency that we had. Okay. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned how the recognition of ECDC was slowly built up over time and obviously has become greater during the, the current pandemic. But the public and the media haven't always focused on public health as it does now, particularly as a result of the pandemic. So going forward, do you think now it should be the topic of everyday discussions in a way that it hasn't been before? Well, obviously, I do think so, but it will not be easy to keep it that way. I mean, there is uh, this policy of health in all policies, this concept of health in all policies. And I think the current pandemic has shown how valid it is because, I mean, this pandemic has basically uh, touched every area of society, every area of life. And this is how it is in essence. Uh, it's just ignored sometimes. Now, coming back to um, uh, infectious diseases and our usual portfolio of work, uh, we have been paying less attention to other health threats. And uh, foremost in my uh, mind is here antimicrobial resistance, but other uh, communicable disease control programs, uh, childhood vaccination in the member states may also have suffered. Uh, from the focus, the necessary focus on COVID now. And that are also all the diseases uh, that are in the center of uh, sustainable development goals like HIV, tuberculosis and hepatitis. But in, in essence, all the other diseases have less attention. Now, there was, of course, a fundamental effect also of these measures against COVID on the uh, transmission of other diseases. I mean, we had many reports that uh, all the gastrointestinal diseases and uh, respiratory diseases were almost non-existent. I mean, we didn't have uh, a lot of cases, if any, of influenza last winter. And that is not because these uh, pathogens have disappeared, 
it is because the measures have um, a limited transmission. So what we have to do now is we have to draw the attention and awareness back to these diseases and look carefully where we have to do catch up because programs have suffered. That is in particular uh, for the vaccine preventable diseases and the childhood programs, because there might be now already maybe two cohorts of children that may have a patchy childhood immunization. So, so we have to really look uh, into this and we have to see how we can use this increased awareness of ECDC and of public health to really get uh, more attention to all the rest of the, the diseases that we're working with. Excellent. Well, you mentioned when we first released a uh, risk assessment uh, all the way back in 2005 and how it's very different to how it is now. And you also mentioned the tracking of airplanes and things like that. How do you see public health and data and challenging public health crises? How can we use data going forward? I believe this will be an area where in the coming years, there is a most fundamental change. And what I have seen during the pandemic is that some issues that we have been talking about since years have moved forward more quickly. Uh, that doesn't mean they're solved, but at least the awareness and the, the, the recognition it's necessary to change this direction has grown. We have, for instance, uh, two areas that I can mention is the whole genome sequencing, where we really have worked since more than five years to convince countries that it's not only good for outbreak, but it's also for surveillance, because you can already differentiate better in the surveillance data. But it's also the, the recognition that we need more digitalized surveillance data. So we have put in our work plan, pilot studies, proof of concept studies. Uh, we also want to do a draft blueprint, how such a digitalized surveillance at the EU level could look like in the future to discuss with our stakeholders in the member states. The new proposal for our mandate also foresees that we actually lead that part uh, of reforming surveillance. Well, it's interesting that you, you bring up possible changes to the mandate. So there are discussions about this being updated going forward in response to the current pandemic. What sort of other changes can we expect from ECDC going forward? The original proposal touched areas, as I already mentioned, of the digitalized surveillance but also a much more increased support to member states' preparedness strengthening. And that uh, we have to see what in the end a uh, member state will accept. But it can range really from um, uh, supporting them in reviewing their plans in terms of, you know, now integrating the lessons learned, uh, but also then uh, for, for the future, revamping these plans, testing the plans doing a regular monitoring based on indicators, but then also support them when there is a crisis with uh, more hands under the keyword uh, European Health Task Force. That task force should also be available at request for third countries, so meaning outside of the EU, recognizing that sometimes uh, it's better to uh, tackle threats outside of the EU before they come to the EU. And that is part of a generalized proposal that ECDC get a wider international range and increases its already considerable uh, international collaboration. The last part uh, that is in there is what we also have seen uh, as, a, as a deficit uh, during this pandemic, that there is no possibility right now to centralize laboratory support in terms of test validation, training, providing reagents uh, in a centralized way uh, to, to the European uh, member states, because now they ho had to do all of this uh, by themselves, which is not really an efficient way. Of handling things. So the European Reference Laboratory uh, uh, part is also a, a new proposal in there. 
We're coming shortly to the end now. If we could uh, pick your brains on a couple of personal issues, what would you say have been your most memorable moments here at ECDC? Well, I have been at ECDC now for 16 years in three different roles. You can probably imagine that there are many memorable uh, moments, but especially when I now for this uh, podcast <laughs> went back in time, I, I really realized that these moments, you know, when we did the training, the first ever training for our European surveillance system, TESI, was something that I won't forget because the week before the training, this database crashed every time you submitted data, which is sort of uh, defying the purpose of a surveillance database. <laughs> And I remember that the team really worked day and night uh, to make it at least stable for the training session. And it was such a, how shall I say, I mean, it was such a, a, a happy moment that when we asked then the participants afterwards whether they feel conf confident that they can submit data to TESI, over 70% said yes. So I thought that was really a big success. And the other moment that I had in the early days was really the having this book with all the European uh, infectious disease data, first annual epidemiological report in my hands. I also <laughs> thought that's a milestone. Wow. So a bit later, I have to say the moment when I was um, announced as director uh, 2017 is also very happy because I could feel that I have the support from the management board and from our colleagues here in ECDC. And uh, I mean, that's not, you know, you can't take this for granted. Of course. What are some of the other biggest challenges that you have faced or ECDC has faced? For me, it was, um, it was and it still is managing the expectations our, from our stakeholders because, and there is significant differences between crisis time and not crisis time between bigger member states and smaller member states. And uh, to bring this together in a way that, you know, everybody is more or less satisfied is really a challenge. Fantastic. Dr. Armand, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. This was my pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this insight into ECDC's early history and a glimpse into its possible future changes with our director, Dr. Andrea Armon. If you would like to know more, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media for the latest news.